So hello, welcome to today's class. Um, today we're going to start chapter 11. We're going to get yeah, even further into chemistry. This is now going to be on chemical bonding. Um, before I get started, just want to talk about the next few weeks in general. Um, this week, as I said, we'll do chapter 11. Um, your lab 12 is due on Friday. This is your last lab. So hand one in on Friday. You don't have another one after it. Homework 10 will be due this week. Next week, I will do chapter 12. Next week is the last week of classes. On that week, homework 11 will be due. And sometime during that week, I will hold an optional review session for the final. I haven't sent that email out yet for the optional review session. Um, there's a reason for that. I'm going to talk about that on the next slide, actually. Um, homework for chapter 12 is going to be due on the May 9th. I am aware that is a Sunday. Um, I want it to be due before finals week, though. Um, so just to warn you. And then the week after will be the finals. They haven't announced the final exam schedule yet. I legitimately don't know when the final is going to be yet. I am very angry about this fact. Um, as soon as I know what it is, I'll let you know. But yeah, I don't know when the final will be yet. Um, and that's why I haven't done a plan for a final exam review schedule. I haven't said another thing to figure out when to offer that yet, because I want to find out when the final is first. Um, hopefully, I can get that taken care of soon. I'm hoping today we get a final exam schedule. I said, I'll shoot an email when I get it. Um, any questions about the upcoming end of the semester, this whole process? OK. So let's get into this chapter then. This chapter, as I said, is about chemical bonding. But before I get into chemical bonding, I need to introduce the law of conservation of mass. You see, almost everything in chemistry is based around this one law. And that law says that metal can neither be created nor destroyed. And it's actually that in general. In this, here I wrote it, it says in a chemical reaction, which is true, but in general, it cannot be created or destroyed. There's nothing you can do to create or destroy metal. Everything goes somewhere. Um, and this might seem a little weird. Like if you burn a candle and you have a candle and you set it on fire, the candle disappears. It's just like the candle is gone now, nothing happens. But if you burn a candle in an airtight container and it doesn't really work because candles need air to burn, but let's say you somehow get around that idea, you'll find that the mass doesn't change. When you burn a candle, the wax doesn't disappear. It just gets melted and becomes gaseous. Nothing can be created or destroyed. And in any chemical reaction, the amount you have of any substance must be the same before and after. This actually can sometimes be used to work out exactly how much of various materials go into a chemical reaction. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to kind of jump right into an example problem before really explaining what I mean by that. But um, as I do this problem, hopefully you understand what I mean. And it says, let's say I have 2.43 grams of magnesium metal and we set it on file. When you set magnesium metal on file, it does this. It gets really, 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 really bright. Like it goes from, and after you burn it, it goes from a shiny metal to a crumbly white powder. That crumbly white powder, powder after it gets set on fire is magnesium oxide. And this is actually a chemical reaction. That's why it glows so much. You're turning magnesium to magnesium oxide. So let's say, as I said before, you start with 2.43 grams of magnesium. And after it gets lit, you have 4.03 grams of magnesium oxide. You can figure out the exact mass of oxygen that it pulled out of the air for this reaction. You see, the logic is, is if you start with this much magnesium and you end up with that much magnesium oxide, the law of conservation of mass says the total mass initial must equal the total mass after. And if we go from magnesium to magnesium oxide, that means we have magnesium bonding to oxygen. And so I can say the mass of magnesium plus the mass of oxygen I started with is going to be the mass of magnesium oxide I end up with. The mass of oxygen that bonded then is just going to be the mass of magnesium oxide minus the mass of magnesium, just subtracting those two numbers. Any questions though?
Okay. No. Sorry, yawning. Tired today. Now, before this, that is getting into chemical reactions, which is actually next chapter. I really want to talk about chemical bonding and compounds in this chapter. And we'll talk about elements a little bit, but really just compounds in general. And last chapter, we talked about how to find the atomic mass of a atom. That if you have, that's not good. Okay, there we go. If you have an atom, you can find its atomic mass. Its atomic mass is how much one atom weighs, and it's just the number on the periodic table. Nitrogen's atomic mass is 14.007 AMU. Carbon is 12.011 AMU. It's the mass on average of an atom, right? That's what atomic mass is. We can actually use, uh, if we have the formula for something, we can also find the mass of a compound. You see, the mass of a compound, a compound is a bunch of atoms bonded together. And the mass of a compound would just be the sum of the elements that make it up. Take, for example, water. Water is H2O. Water is two hydrogens and one oxygen. According to my periodic table, hydrogen has a mass of 1.01 .01 AMU. Oxygen has a mass of 16 AMU. H2O is two hydrogens and one oxygen. What that means is I can say two times the mass of hydrogen plus the mass of oxygen, that's the mass of water. And you can actually find the mass of individual, com um, individual molecules of a compound just by adding up each element. And so yeah, water is H2O, it's two H's and an O. That's the mass of a water molecule. Does that make sense? This also ties into the law of definite proportions. The law of definite proportions says compounds always contain the same elements in a constant proportion by mass. And what I mean by that is take table salt. Table salt is sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is 39.3% sodium and 60.7% chlorine. It doesn't matter if you have one grain of salt, a mountain of salt, a salt shaker of salt. It is always 39.3% sodium and 60.7% chlorine. The reason we can do that, or know that, is because percentage, in general, any percentage, a percentage is just a part over a whole. For any type of percent, you want to say what percent of something is another thing, it's the amount of a component over the total amount, times 100 to convert it to a percentage. In any compound, we can say what percentage by mass is made up of each part. I mean, sodium chloride, if you go by atoms, each sodium chloride molecule is half sodium, half chlorine. But by mass, it is 39.3% sodium, 60.7% chlorine. And how I found that is I said, what is the mass of sodium over the mass of sodium chloride? And so I would say the, the percent sodium is just the mass of sodium over the mass of sodium chloride. The percent chlorine is the mass chlorine over the mass of sodium chloride. And the thing is, if I have a mound of salt, it's kind of a bitch to go and measure out how much of it is sodium, how much is chlorine. But the law of definite proportions say these numbers are also set, that it's always 39.3% sodium, no matter how much you have. What this means is if you have a compound, you can find what percentage it is made up of which element. And how to do that is assume you have only one molecule or formula unit. I'll get back to those terms later on. Assume you only have one of it. If I want to know what percentage of sodium chloride is sodium, I say, let's say I just have one piece of sodium chloride. One sodium molecule, one sorry, one sodium atom, one chlorine atom. That's it. If I have one sodium atom and one chlorine atom, I can find the mass of sodium chloride. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, NaCl. There's no subscripts. So I could say one sodium chlorine formula unit is the mass of one sodium plus one chlorine, taking those numbers from a periodic table. Once again, when you see these boxes at the top, that's just me stealing from a periodic table. Oops. And so one sodium chloride is 58.44 AMU, just the mass of sodium plus the mass of chlorine. That's how I got the percent sodium. That's how I got the percent chlorine. You see the percent sodium, would be the mass of sodium over the total mass. 
There's 22.99 grams or AMU of sodium. So 22.99 over 58.44. The percentage chlorine will be the mass of chlorine over the total mass. And that's how I get these percentages. Any questions? I'm going to do one more example, a little more complicated. Take, for example, uh, sulfuric acid. Its sulfuric acid form is H2SO4. And let's say I ask for the mass ratio. Anytime I ask for the mass ratio, it's first time I'm using this term. Mass ratio just says what percentage is what is of what? What percentage of sulfuric acid is hydrogen? What percentage of sulfuric acid is sulfur? What percentage of sulfuric acid is oxygen? That's what that means. That's what I'm going to solve for. If I want to know what percentage of sulfuric acid is hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen respectfully, respectfully, respectively, I have to find the mass I have of each one of them. You see, so I guess it's H2. H2 means it has two hydrogens. Each hydrogen atom weighs 1.01 .01 AMU. So I have 2.02 .02 AMU of hydrogen in one molecule of sulfuric acid. H2SO4 has only one S. So it has 32.07 AMU of sulfur. And it has four oxygens. Each oxygen weighs 16 AMU. So my mass of oxygen is 64 AMU, four times 16. This means one molecule of sulfuric acid has a mass of 98.09 AMU, where I just added those three numbers. Okay. Good so far. Okay. Not going to move anything, just make more space. The mass ratio will be the mass of each element over the total. Now, if I want to get what percentage of sulfuric acid is hydrogen, I am not going to use 1.01. .01. I have 2.02 .02 AMU of hydrogen. Therefore, the mass percent of hydrogen will be that number over the total. I have 2.02 .02 AMU of hydrogen. The total is 98.09. .09, so I'll just divide those two numbers. To get the percent sulfur, I'll use the mass of sulfur over the total. To get the mass of oxygen, oh, sorry, percent oxygen, I'll use the mass of oxygen over the total. It's of note your percentages should always add up to 100. Uh, 65 plus 32 is 95, 97. Uh, we got about 97.789. We have about 97.9, 97.9 plus 2.0, 2.1, 100. Your total percentage should always equal 100. Okay. Now this has a kind of interesting effect because let's say you have a vial of sulfuric acid. 2% of the mass is hydrogen. 32% of the mass is sulfur. 65% of the mass is oxygen. And this gets into an idea of what is called a limiting reactant. When you mix compounds and cause a chemical reaction, they will have a very set mass ratio. Um, copper sulfide is pretty close to 66% copper, 5% sulfur. It's not exactly the rate mass ratio, but it's really goddamn close. What this means is if you put 10 grams of copper mixed with 5 grams of sulfur, you'll get 15 grams of copper sulfide. And once again, it'll have a ratio of about twice as much copper as sulfur. But let's say you mix 10 grams of copper and 7 grams of sulfur. You're not going to get 17 grams of copper sulfide. You're going to get the same amount of copper sulfide and just two extra grams of sulfur left over. You see, when you do this reaction, the product must have the same mass ratio. It must have this one to two ratio of copper and sulfur. 
This is called a limiting reactant. Whenever a chemical reaction works, unless you have perfectly the exact amount, there will always be what is the limiting reactant and the excess reactant. The limiting reactant is what you run out of first and causes the experiment to stop working. The excess reactant is whichever one you have extra of. In this li middle line here, this line B, I would say copper is the limiting reactant because when I'm mixing the copper and sulfur, it'll react to it runs out of copper. Copper limits it. It stops it. Sulfur is the excess reactant. Now, if it, I instead took 5.06 grams of sulfur and extra copper, I still end up with the same amount of copper sulfide, but I end up with extra copper. That in any reaction, the mass ratio will always be the same in the product. So something will always run out first. Okay. Any questions though? Let me show you this in practice. This would be one I do live in class, but you know, that doesn't work. This chemical reaction, which looks stupidly complicated, what it says is if you take baking soda and you mix baking soda with vinegar, it produces a gas, waddle, and something dissolved in waddle. That's what that says. This is the baking soda and vinegar problem. You put baking soda and vinegar together, they foam up. What's going to happen is I'm about to show a video that um, I didn't bother doing this myself and because normally I do it live. Instead of filming me doing it, I just found a video online of someone else doing it. But what this video is going to have is a series of balloons. In each balloon, they have an increased number of baking soda. And they in each balloon, they all have the exact same amount of vinegar. And so it's kind of hard to tell here. But each one has the same amount of acidic acid. Acidic acid is vinegar. And she's going to pour the exact same amount of acid into each of these flasks, which I'm going to jump forward because you don't need to watch her slowly pour it. Sodium bicarbonate, that's baking soda. And she's going to add some baking soda to each one. And if you look at the little things in front of each balloon, you can see that they kind of, you know, when we go from left to right, that there's more baking soda. And you don't have to hear the music, so be happy. It's real bad tech now. So what we're going to do is drop the baking soda in the vinegar. When she drops the baking soda in the vinegar, the reaction occurs, producing a gas. Now, going from left to right, each one has more baking soda in it. I or She continuously ups the baking soda. But what you see is the first one, not much baking soda, doesn't produce much gas. The second one, more baking soda, more gas. The third one, more baking soda, more gas. The fourth one, more baking soda, the same amount of gas. And the fifth one, more baking soda, the same amount of gas. That's because in steps one, two, and three, baking soda was the limiting reactant. But I have, she eventually added more baking soda than the vinegar could handle. And in fact, I can't remember, well, it might be a guy. No, it's a girl. Um, I don't think she shows it. You can't. She doesn't. Um, that if we look at the first one, it looks very clear. And the last, if they get look a little cloudy still, that's because there's baking soda just sitting on the bottom. This is the idea of like a limiting reactant. The size maxes out because early on, our limiting reactant was baking soda. After we add enough baking soda, the limiting reactant becomes vinegar. And that's why it happens. Any questions? Okay. Um, why this works was first explained by John Dalton. He was the guy who was the first model of the atom. And what John Dalton said is each element is composed of atoms, which are identical for each element, but different from different elements. Once again, he didn't know about neutrons yet, so we, we're not going to hold that against him. And he said, chemical combinations are the bonding of definite small number ratio of atoms, and a compound always has the same form. And this means that, you know, vinegar is always um, CH3COOH. It's never anything else. 
Baking soda is always NaHC3O. It's never anything else. Water is always H2O. Carbon dioxide is always CO2. That they always will have the same structure. And he said in all chemical reactions, no atoms are gained or lost or changed. That if you're in a chemical reaction, you start with hydrogen, you end up with hydrogen. If you start with carbon, you end up with carbon. All that happens is they're arranged differently. And that a chemical reaction is taking the various atoms and just switching who they're partnered up with and how they're structured. And minus the whole neutron existing part, this is what we believe today. Water is always H2O. And all chemistry and all chemical reactions are following this law that is taking the various elements and rearranging how they're formed, how they are bonded together, which actually is my goal for today, even though I'm halfway into class already, is to talk about chemical bonding and what this means. Here's the general idea. All elements in the same family have the same number of valence electrons. We covered that last time. Elements in the same family also bond the same way. That if you take everything in the uh, family 1A and tell them to bond with chlorine, they'll all bond in a one-to-one -one ratio. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium all bond with chlorine the exact same way. What that means is logically that valence electrons must be involved. Also, if you remember, I said before that noble gases do not respond. He helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and um, radon. So they all have eight valence electrons, except for helium, which has two. Since they all have eight valence electrons, except for helium with two, that eight must somehow be the key. And this leads us to what is called the octet rule. All elements want to have a full valence shell. Everyone's goal is to have a full valence shell. And if anyone does not have a full valence shell, they would do whatever is necessary to make it so that they have a full valence shell. Now, this is really only true for the representative elements, aka not these yellow ones, not these green ones. They're more complicated. We're not going to worry about them for now. But for everyone else, it's if you don't have eight, you're getting eight. That's the plan. And what happens is compound, well, there's some exceptions to that. To that eight rule, the exception is hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen and helium are okay with two. Everyone wants eight, but hydrogen and helium. It's actually a little more complicated than that too, but I'll come back to that idea. And what happens is the process of forming compounds, the process of making compounds is just atoms or elements, either gaining, losing, or sharing valence electrons to fill this outer shell. That all chemical bonds is just the atoms going, hey, I don't have eight valence electrons. I'm going to do what's needed to get that number. Except, once again, for hydrogen. Hydrogen's cool with two. Now, it's actually a tiny bit more complicated than that. Because it's not necessarily eight is what's important. It's a full shell. So, lithium right here, which only starts with one valence electron, has a total of three electrons. It doesn't necessarily need to go to eight. Really what we can say is everyone wants to either go to eight or zero. The reason for this, the reason that it's really eight or zero, you know, actually I'll draw it on here, is let's say we have an atom, there's my nucleus, and it has two electrons in the first energy level, and three electrons in the next energy level. OK? You know what? Hold on a second. Let's do this battle. So, dink. First energy level, second energy level. OK, so there's two electrons in the first energy level three electrons in the second energy level. Its goal is to have an outermost shell full. And so it could try to go to eight. It could uh, have three. It could try to add five more electrons and just say, I'm going to do green for ones I'm adding. And say it adds one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. That would make it happy. It would have eight. But once again, it's not really that I want eight. I want to have a full shell. 
You see, this also could, instead of that, just ditch this electron, ditch this electron, ditch this electron. This shell is now gone. And the shell inside that is full. Really, your goal for everyone except hydrogen and helium should be either zero or eight. That the goal isn't necessarily eight, but it's they do whatever they need to do to either have zero valence electrons or eight valence electrons. And every element except for hydrogen and helium will go and trade or give or take electrons to hit these magical numbers, zero or eight. And if they have zero or eight, they're happy. They're, they're content. Life is what it should. Um, I'm going to personify electrons and atoms a lot in this chapter. And there's a lot of things I'm going to say that are going to sound like sappy life lessons. It's not on purpose. It's just kind of the chemistry behind it. And it sounds like sappy life lessons. I'll warn you now. But everyone will do whatever they need to get zero or eight. And they'll do, once again, whatever's necessary. They can try to get to that zero or eight number, which once again is two for hydrogen and helium. And I'm going to have that exception a lot. Anytime I sound the zero or eight, except for hydrogen or helium, I actually will very seldom talk about helium since it's a noble gas. Really, it's hydrogen is going to be the big exception. But they will hit this magical zero or eight number one of two ways. Either in what is called an ionic bond or what is called a covalent bond. An ionic bond is any time you mix a metal and a non-metal. And an ionic bond is give and take. In an ionic bond, what happens is metals say, you know what, I really want to go to zero. And they just give away valence electrons until they have zero. Non-metals are all like, hey, if you're, if you're giving it away, I'll take it. And they'll take these electrons until they hit eight. That's what an ionic bond is between a metal and a non-metal. It's the transfer of electrons. It is the process of a metal giving its electrons to a non-metal. So that the metal goes to from whatever number of valence electrons they have to zero, and the non-metal goes from the number they have to eight, except for hydrogen, which only wants one. Now, if you have one thing of a ionic bond, that's called a formula unit. However, non-metals can also bond with non-metals. Anytime you have a non-metal bonding with non-metal, they're both greedy sons of a bitches. They don't want to give electrons. See, metals are like, I'm nice, I give away my electrons, you can have them. But you got a group of non-metals together, they want to take. No one wants to give and everyone wants to take. And so instead of that, they will share electrons. When non-metal bonds with a non-metal, you have what is called a covalent bond, where you have a sharing of electrons, that the electrons spend time with both of them. The base unit for a covalent bond is a molecule. And it will be they share electrons so that everyone has eight electrons, except for hydrogen, which only gets two. Now, I'm going to go in depth of both these types of bonds. But mostly today is just going to be ionic. I'll really get into covalent next class. Any questions so far? OK. So last chapter, we talked about things ionizing, right? becoming an ion. We said, you know, atom has electrons holding protons. Some atoms will give up electrons. Some accept electrons. That's based off metallic character. And one of the things I said is any time an atom changes the number of electrons it has, it's no longer an atom. It is now a ion or an ion. And an ion is just an atom that changed the number of electrons. It either gained electrons or lost electrons. And what it is, is if you have an ion, an ion will have a set charge. And the charge will just be the number of protons minus the number of electrons. Take, for example, if you have sodium. Sodium has 11 electrons. When sodium becomes an ion, it gives someone away. And it, when it gives one away, it then has 10 electrons. Now, its atomic number is 11. So it starts and has 11 protons. When it gives it away, it has, it has 10 electrons. Sodium has a charge of plus one. That's what happens. If something gains electrons, like oxygen, oxygen has eight protons. When oxygen ionizes, it gains two electrons to have 10. Eight minus 10 is negative two. An oxygen ion has a charge negative two. And there's the general idea. Protons never change, but things can give or take electrons to hit that magic number to end up with zero valence electrons or eight valence electrons or in case of hydrogen too. And they'll do whatever, they'll gain a charge from this. 
Now, what's going to happen is metals will always give away electrons. And metals will give away the valence shell, basically. That a metal will see how many valence electrons it has and just dump them all. Sodium has one valence electron. It's going to dump one electron. Magnesium, actually, let's just go back to highlighting. So everyone here has one valence electron. They'll dump all of them to get a charge plus one. Everyone here has two valence electrons. They'll dump all of them to get a charge plus two. These guys have three valence electrons. They'll dump all of them to get plus three. These guys have four valence electrons. They'll dump them to get plus four. Nonmetals, on the other hand, they don't take dump electrons. They gain electrons. And they'll gain however many electrons they need to hit that eight number. And so they'll get a negative charge because they have extra electrons. Now, for our representative elements, well, once again, our representative elements are these guys and these guys, just those. For our representative elements, everyone's goal is going to be hit that 0, 8 number, except for hydrogen. Metals will always go for the 0. Metals will give away every valence electron they have. What this means is when a metal becomes an ion, it'll be start having a charge equal to the number of valence electrons it had. Keep in mind, the number of valence electrons an atom has can be represented by its family on the periodic table. And so everything in family 1A start with one valence electrons. When they ionize, they'll get a charge plus one. Everything in family 2A had two valence electrons. When they ionize, they'll get a charge plus two, and so on. Nonmetals are taking electrons. When a nonmetal ionizes, when a nonmetal ionizes, it'll gain electrons. And a nonmetal will gain a charge equal to the number of valence electrons it started with minus eight. For example, in group 7A, uh, mouse. in group 7A, fluorine right here, fluorine is in group 7A. That means it has seven valence electrons. When fluorine ionizes, its charge will be seven minus eight. Seven minus eight is negative one. Fluorine will have a charge negative one. Oxygen in group 6A has six valence electrons. When it ionizes, six minus eight, negative two. When oxygen ionizes, it'll have a charge negative two. Okay. So metals will always get a positive charge equal to the number of valence electrons. Non-metals will always get a negative charge equal to the number of valence electrons minus eight. Now, there's a few other terms you need to know with this. Um, the first is cation and anion. Um, when metals become an ion, they'll always be positive. Anytime you have a positive ion, it's called a cation. Nonmetals always become negatively charged. Anytime you have a negative ion, you call it an anion. When you write the charge of an ion, either cation or anion, what it is is you subscript the charge. So when sodium becomes an ion, it gets a charge plus one. So you you super sorry I said subscript, but I meant superscript. So you superscript a plus one. When and I don't think I wrote this out here. I should have. Where is that slide? I swear the slide going through this. When um, a non-metal gets a charge, it becomes a negative anion. You superscript the negative number. It is of note. Oh, it is later on. Okay. Um, I got a few more things about the saying how to write this, but I'll cover it when I get to it. Um, of note, you got to remember cation is positive and anion is negative. A good number of years ago, I had a student who said this out loud in class when I taught chemistry. And I hate it because it's such a bad pun, but it helps people remember it. It's actually how I remember it now, that cations are positive, anions are negative. And how they remember it is cations are positive because cats have paws. If that will help you remember that cations are positive and anions are negative, feel free to use it. It's a um, pretty painfully bad pun. But the general idea is because everyone's charge is based off their valence electrons. That means everyone's charge is based off their family. And so all the metals in family 1A will have a charge plus one. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium. Hydrogen's not a metal. It gets thrown out. All of the metals in family 2A will have a charge plus two. 
all the families in 3A will have a charge plus 3. Now, 4A starts getting weird because there's some metals in 4A and there's some non-metals in 4A. Now, you notice also I'm not highlighting um, the semi-metals. The semi-metals get a little weird. They can kind of go either way. We're not going to get into them too much. But the metals will start with four valence electrons, so they'll have a charge plus four. The non-metals have four valence electrons, so their charge will be four minus eight. Four minus eight is negative four. Ow, I just punched something. So their charge will be negative four. And so carbon has a charge negative four, while tin has a charge plus four. In family 5A, and at this point I'm ignoring the metals down here, the non-metals have five valence electrons. Five minus eight is negative three. They have a charge of negative three. In six, eight, six, a six minus eight is negative two. These guys have a charge of negative two. In seven, a seven minus eight is negative one. These guys have a charge negative one. And the noble gases have eight valence electrons. Eight minus eight is zero. They don't have an ionic charge. This is why they don't bond. Some periodic tables have these numbers written on the top, plus one, plus two, plus three, plus or minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero. Um, I don't, it's not written on the one I give you. I expect you just to be able to figure that out by number of valence electrons and numbers, number of valence electrons minus eight. But that's the general idea. The middle is weird. It gets complicated as in the ones I skipped. We're not gonna worry about those. Questions? It is worth knowing how to write an ion. Uh, how you write an ion is you say the name of the atom and you superscript the charge. Uh, of note, normally in math, if something is negative, you mark it as negative. If it's positive, you don't mark anything, right? Like if it's a positive three, you don't put a plus sign, you just put a three. For this, you always want to put the plus sign. So oxygen has a charge negative two, so you write it as O2 minus. Traditionally, you always put the number first, then the sign. You don't write negative two, you write two minus. Why you do that, I have no goddamn idea. It drives me crazy. I'll just state now, I will never take off points for doing it the other way. In fact, I will sometimes write it the other way. I'll write like O negative two, because that just seems more logical to me. <laughs> negative two instead of two negative. Um, but officially it should be two negative, but I'll accept it either way. And so oxygen, which has a charge of negative two, you write it as O2 minus. Alumin, which has a charge plus three, you write it as Al3 plus. Of note, if a charge is plus one or negative one, you do not write the one, but you still put the sign. So lithium with a charge plus one is lithium plus. Chlorine with a charge of negative one is chlorine minus. And anytime you see these symbols on an element, they're no longer an atom. If I write Cl, that's an atom. If I write Cl minus, that's an ion, because it means it gained an electron. OK? Now, I said I was only really going to talk about the, the representative elements. And I said I was going to ignore this block down here. Um, I'm going to talk about these guys for a split second because it's kind of interesting what they can do. Representative elements will only form one ion. The metals, though, the ion, the charge would be the number of valence electrons. The non-metals would be number of valence electrons minus eight. The transition metals, they can form multiple ions because they're not necessarily based off, oops, what did I just hit? Okay, that works. They're not necessarily based off um, valence electrons. Well, they are, but it's more complicated. Take, for example, copper. Copper can form an ion with a charge plus one. Copper can also charge form an ion with a charge plus two. Gold can form an ion with a charge plus one. Gold can form an ion with a charge plus three. All of these yellow ones here and the ones off the bottom can do shit like this. Therefore, when we talk about them, we have to be very careful that we keep track of which one it is. Uh, there's a few different systems of naming. People used to use the Latin system of naming, uh, which I'll kind of show in a second, where they use Latin names to keep track of them. But no one uses Latin anymore, and the Latin system of naming is dying out. It is more common now to use the stock system of naming. 
And the stock system of naming is if you have a transition metal, when you say the name of the metal, you follow it by the number, by its charge. And if you're saying it out loud, you'd say ion with a charge plus two is ion two. Ion with a charge plus three is ion three. For writing it, you include a Roman numeral with its charge. So ion two is ion I I. Ion three is ion I I I. And when you have a compound with them, you have to include the stock name. You can say we have chromium two chloride or chromium three chloride. Well, chromium two chloride and chromium three chloride have different properties. And so you kind of need to keep track of them. How I know that this one is chromium two and this one's chromium three, we'll get back to that. Um, and I get a little further in ionic bonds, we'll cover that in more detail. Well, that might not, I don't know if I'll get to that today. It might be Wednesday. Okay. So back in the day, a few years ago now, I used to teach intro chem. And what I taught intro chem, this was the inside back cover of the textbook. And I think it's so useful that I put the slide in it. This is something that can just help you. This gives the names of cations and anions. It has the Latin system of naming, but as I said, no one uses it anymore. So you could ignore this entire box down here. But does say like cobalt can be cobalt two or cobalt three. Copper can be copper one or copper two. It actually has some of the other ones too. Um, though that you can figure out most things from the table. This also has the polyatomic ions. So if you need a list of polyatomic ions and what the name in charge is, use this. Okay. This is just here for your help. It's also on the back of my periodic table, but. Okay. One more term I want to cover today. Isoelectric. Let's say you got a sodium. You have a sodium atom and becomes an ion. When sodium, sodium as an atom has 11 protons and 11 electrons. That's its atomic number. The atomic number of sodium is 11. So that is its number of protons. That is its number of electrons. When sodium ionizes, it has one valence electron. So it loses one electron. So when sodium ionizes, it goes from 11 electrons to 10. Meanwhile, Let's talk about fluorine. Fluorine has an atomic number nine. So it starts with nine protons and nine electrons. Fluorine, when it ionizes, gains an electron. And so when it gains an electron, it goes from nine electrons to 10. Both the sodium ion and the fluorine ion have 10 electrons. The atoms are different. The atoms have 11 and nine respectively. But once they're ionized, they each have 10. We say sodium and fluorine are isoelectric. Isoelectric just means same number of electrons. And it's of note, when things ionize, what they're doing, what their goal is, what is happening here, is they are becoming isoelectric with noble gases. Because noble gases have full valence shells. That when sodium and fluorine ionize, they both become isoelectric to each other, but also to neon. Neon started with 10, valent, 10 electrons. It has eight valence electrons and two further in. It was happy already. Now they are two. OK. So let's say this happens. We start mixing compounds, some metals and nonmetals. And what happens is the metal is going to ionize. And when the metal ionizes, they're going to say, hey, I got all these electrons. I'm going to go sell them at the garage sale. And the nonmetals walk by and say, oh, shit, a whole bunch of electrons. I'm taking these and take them. When the metals and the nonmetals mix, the metals will form cations, giving away electrons. The nonmetals will form anions, taking the electrons. But let's think about what happens. You see, the metal gains a positive charge. And a nonmetal gains a negative charge. Way back when in chapter eight, I introduced Coulomb's law. It says the force between charged particles is a constant, which is Coulomb's constant, the charge of one particle times the charge of another particle over the distance between them squared. And I said, if you have a charged particle and a negative particle, they'll attract. 
And so what happens when the metal ionizes, which causes the nonmetal to ionize? You have a ch positive charge particle and a negative charge particle. And if you have a positive charge particle and a negative charge particle, and a force will pull them together. That is the ionic bond. An ionic bond is any time a metal gives the electron to a nonmetal and the Coulomb interaction causing this bond. Now, they normally form a crystalline structure. They form in lattices, in nice grids. But that's all it is. It is the Coulomb force from chapter 8 holding them together after one atom gave its electron away to another. OK? Here's the idea. So say you have sodium chloride. Sodium has one valence electron. Chlorine has seven valence electrons. This can be drawn in what's called a Lewis dot structure, which is what the picture on the bottom is. I'm not going to get into those for ions. I'll talk about them later on for molecules. But it's just a way of you just do dots for however many valence electrons you have. The picture above is the full setup. That sodium starts with an atomic number of 11, so it has 11 electrons. Chlorine starts with an atomic number of 17, it has 17 electrons. But more important, sodium's in family 1A, so it has one valence electron. Chlorine's in family 7A, so it has seven valence electrons. And what is is sodium goes to zero. It takes its one valence electron and boots it to the curb. When sodium gives away its one valence electron, we now go into the row before, which is now full. Chlorine takes that valence electron. When chlorine takes it, it goes from seven valence electrons to eight valence electrons. It now has a full shell. And you end up with a sodium of a charge plus one, a chlorine of a charge negative one. And that force holds them together. Okay. Now, atoms can't be created or destroyed, but neither can electrons. When a chemical bond forms, and uh, sorry, an ionic bond forms. What's going to happen is we're going to be mixing positive and negative ions. We'll be mixing our cations and our anions. But here's the important thing. In any given ionic compound, the overall charge will be zero. That however many electrons the metal gave away, that's how many electrons the nonmetal took. And that it always has to balance out. Um, it's worth noting group 1A and group 2A from are called salts, uh, but I don't know why I bothered saying that. It's not that important. And what happens when we have a formula unit is the total charge must be zero. Sodium chloride is one sodium and one chlorine because we have a charge plus one and a charge negative one. Let's say you have calcium chloride. When calcium chloride has two valence electrons, so when calcium chloride ionizes, it gives away two. And if calcium is going to bond with chlorine, chlorine only wants one. So if it's giving away two, one chlorine walks by and says, I'll take that. But it only takes one of them. Another chlorine is needed to take the other guy. That's why calcium chloride is CaCl2. Because we have a charge plus two, we need a charge negative two to make up for it. We need two of them. Now, mathematically, scientifically, that is what's happening. But for ease, that's not how we're going to talk about it. When you want to work out an ionic formula, and you want to say, what is an ionic compound? compound? How is it written? What we're going to do is we'll keep track of the charge of each ion. What is the charge of the ion of the cation? What is the charge of the negative? And we'll use something called the crossover method or the diagonal method to work out the structure of the compound. Now, I admittedly only have one minute left. That would be really, 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 really rushed for me to do it in a minute. So I'm actually going to stop there, and I will pick up on this on Wednesday and cover it then. Um, otherwise, though, that's today's lecture, and I'll see you on Wednesday.